pleasure to welcome. Okay. <laughs> Donc, je recommence. Bienvenue à tous. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Pierre Fleury uh, today for our seminar. So, most of you know Pierre because uh, he has been uh, studying uh, at the Institute for his PhD during three years. And you defended your PhD in 1915 on topics related to 1915. Et si vous n'êtes pas content, je continue en français, d'accord? <laughs> Information of the relativist. C'est bien Einstein, 1915. C'est exactement ça. Bon, on va continuer. Tout à Pierre, uh, talking in, in 20, uh, 2015, 15, sorry. And then you went uh, on a series of postdocs in Cape Town, Geneva, and Madrid. And uh, you were hired uh, at CNRS in uh, the section in theoretical physics in, two, in, in 2021. And now you are. Uh, sharing your time between uh, IPHT in Saclay and uh, Montpellier, where you spend a lot of time. And so Pierre has been working mostly on, uh, on weak lensing, strong lensing. So lensing in general, trying to reconcile weak and strong lensing. He has been also doing a lot of uh, work on um, relativistic cosmology and uh, some work on the modified gravity and the propagation of gravity waves in, in, in these theories. And he has been referring from very theoretical uh, topics to more and more topics related to observation. And now you are part of the Euclid and, uh, and Lisa Consortium. So today, I know you will talk about your, your work on, on strong and, and weak lensing. I also wanted to, to mention that Pierre has been uh, teaching quite a lot. He's a very good teacher. He has written this, uh, this small book on gravitation from Newton to Einstein that you can find. It's, it's on the archive, I think, yes. the text. Don't buy it. And yes, don't buy it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very nice introduction uh, at a master level. And Pierre has been doing that because it was what, uh, 20, uh, 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, you went to Cameroon to, to teach uh, for one month cosmology in, uh, in the Ames Network, so African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. I think you went twice to, to, to Cameroon to, to teach that, and, and then you, you, you wrote this, uh, this uh, small textbook, introductory textbook. So, Pierre, thank you for being here. We listen to you. Thank you very much, Jean Philippe. Thank you for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, so, so many to this uh, colloquium. It's actually an, an honor for me to, uh, to give the colloquium of IAP, because as you said, I was a PhD student here. So, you know, 10 years ago, I was, I was uh, sitting here and listening to uh, the colloquia and thinking, well, maybe one day. Anyway, so, uh, so really, yeah, thank you for coming. So this is, um, this is a colloquium. So my goal is really to do something to, to give a presentation that is as pedagogical and introductory as possible. So I really hope that it's not going to be too easy. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, the, that's the goal. Please interrupt me at any time if there is something that's not clear. And with this, uh, well, let's go. So we're going to talk about, as the name indicates, about gravitational lensing. And in particular about uh, Einstein rings and the way we could use uh, lensing and Einstein rings in particular to do uh, cosmology. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is actually, so who knows what an Einstein ring is? Who's sure that they know what an Einstein ring is? No, no, I don't. Who knows what an Einstein ring is? Yes. Find one in cosmos. Huh? Find one in cosmos. Yes, well, not not just well, not just one, but there are quite. A few. Well, so okay, so let's start with the easy stuff. And again, it's a colloquium, so I will I will start with beautiful pictures because this is more to catch your attention, I suppose, before diving a bit more into the details. So this is the most beautiful example of what, that we have of an Einstein ring. So an Einstein ring is an ex it's the most spectacular example of the strong gravitational lensing regime. So what you see here is a, so in the foreground, it's a, a luminous red galaxy, uh, so elliptical galaxy, that is, uh, I think, at redshift about 0 0.5. And what you see around it is the image of a background galaxy, so a blue galaxy that is located behind this one, but because of the gravitational lensing effect, so namely the fact that light falls, the light can go around that foreground galaxy, and therefore you see it as, as a ring like this. So um, this is really the most 
beautiful manifestation of the equivalence principle in a sense, which is uh, maybe the big difference that you would have between the Newtonian description of gravitation and the relativistic description of gravitation. The fact that it's not just masses that are the source of gravitation and that experience gravitation, but, all, but anything that has energy, including light. So this is an example uh, of, uh, of an Einstein ring. So if we put it into context, so this one has been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. If we put it in the, in the, in the, in the field uh, where it was seen, so you see that uh, to give you an idea of the orders of magnitude, uh, this one is one, it's one of the biggest that is, that's ever been seen. It's about 10 arc seconds in diameter, 10 seconds of arc. So as a comparison, it's about the apparent size of Mars. So it's a pretty big object in a sense, uh, this, this Einstein ring. But of course it's much fainter, so that's why we needed the Hubble Space Telescope to see it so well. Um, so these objects are not that rare. Uh, even with the telescopes that we have today, it's a few uh, tens, uh, more than a hundred that have been observed already. <clears throat> this is a well-known catalog of, uh, of Einstein rings that uh, has been observed by the Sloan, uh, so the Sloan Lens uh, act, uh, ACS, or so the SLACS sample, uh, so of, the, uh, of the Sloan telescope. Uh, so you have here ab about 84, uh, 84 examples of lenses. They are a bit small. Um, what did I want to say about it? Yes, and uh, so uh, we have a few tens at the moment, but we expect to multiply these numbers by about a thousand with the um, current general, next future generation surveys like Euclid or uh, Rubin telescopes. Um, what can I say about uh, something more about rings? So sometimes uh, you see objects like this. So this is known as an Einstein cross rather than an Einstein ring. What you see here is uh, so same kind of context. You have a foreground galaxy, this one, a background one, but this turns out to be a quasar. So an, acti an active galactic nucleus that's extremely bright, that's a, like a point source at the center of the source galaxy. And that is imaged four times uh, and that you see the four images here. So these objects are very interesting in cosmology. We're going to come back to it because you can actually measure the time delay of the reception of the light uh, or corresponding to the three, uh, the four different images here. And we're going to come back uh, like to, hello, you can sit if you want, don't worry. <laughs> right, so, so far I've, I've shown examples of strong gravitational lensing where the lens, the deflector object is a galaxy. Of course, some very beautiful images that you might have seen involve other deflectors that are galaxy clusters instead. And so you have probably all seen this picture, which was the first picture that was released of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So where you can see here uh, a cluster of galaxies. So these are basically the, the bunch of, um, of uh, white stuff here. And you see a lot of images here that are Arcs, so they are background galaxies, galaxies that are not that do not belong to the cluster, but that, that are beyond, behind it, and that that are multiply imaged and extremely distorted. So this is a very beautiful example as well of gravitational lensing that is really ubiquitous uh, in this type of kind of pictures. So when you have galaxies, so I talked about lenses being uh, galaxy clusters or galaxies. Sometimes you have both at the same time. And again, I keep showing interesting images just to discuss the phenomenology of gravitational lensing and particularly like this system. So again, you have here a gravitation, uh, sorry, a, um, a galaxy cluster that is also, pro that is producing strong lensing. So you can see here, uh, this galaxy that is imaged three times. <coughs> this is one image, you have another one here and another one here. So these are three images of the same galaxy. And here you have a zoom on one of those images. And what you see, the bright spot here that corresponds to this is not, does not belong to the source galaxy but it is another galaxy that belongs to the galaxy cluster and that is acting as a lens on top of the effect of, of the lensing effect of the cluster. So in other words, this image here of, uh, of this galaxy that actually that you see here is uh, experiences the gravitational field of the galaxy cluster and on top of it, 
the effect of a galaxy that turned out to be on the way of the light corresponding to that image. And that, so that leads to a double effect of gravitational lensing, and that revealed a fantastic effect. These four points that you see here are four images of a supernova that exploded in that source galaxy. When people notice that, so this is the uh, one of the two only examples that we know of strongly lensed, uh, or multiply imaged supernova. It was predicted because this belongs to one of three images of uh, the same galaxy, that the, we should see the supernova exploding a bit later on another image. And indeed, about a year after, so this was in 2014, in 2015 or 16, there was another explosion of a supernova that appeared here that was just the same supernova, but that appeared a bit later in uh, another image. And actually, when people uh, digged into the, um, into the archival HST data, they noticed that there was also an explosion here in the 90s. So this is an interesting phenomenology of things that can happen with gravitational lensing. Multiple images, strong distortions, time delays between events that happen uh, at the level of the source. Maybe as a last example, there's this one that I really like, and also because it connects with, uh, with the title of my talk. So um, lensing, because it is uh, focusing light, it allows you, it, it creates a magnification effect. So it allows you to see things that you wouldn't see in the absence of lensing, just like when you put a lens uh, or, or, a, or a microscope to see things a bit better. Which, so in particular here, what we see is, so this is again a galaxy cluster. This is a, this arc here that is zoomed in here is the very distorted image of a background galaxy. And what you see here, this little spot here that was, uh, uh, was uh, baptized Arendelle is a star. It's one star at redshift 6.2. So this is the farthest individual stars that, that, have, that has ever been observed. And this was possible thanks to gravitational lensing due to the cumulative, cumulative effect of the strong lensing produced by this galaxy cluster and to some micro lensing effect that turned out to be a compact object on the way that magnified very strongly that object on top of the strong lensing effect. So with lensing, you can also see individual stars at cosmological distances. So it's been called Arendelle uh, because this is an old English word that means um, morning star, rising star. And there is also, of course, a Lord of the Ring reference um, that was intended according to the authors. Yeah, the other dots cool. are also stars? I don't know. The it's same a good stars. question. I think this, this might be also, so they could be uh, clusters of stars, like uh, global clusters. I don't know. I only know that this one is a star. <laughs> but that was recognized to be a star because of its spectrum. Thanks to the spectrum. Yeah, so if you want more in information about it, Cohen well, actually, so this is the J JWST image. It has been observed with HST first. Uh, it was maybe a year ago. Uh, and so there was a follow-up with JWST uh, where it appears. So the JWST image is really much more beautiful than the, than the HST one, that's why I showed it. But it's been discovered by, uh, by HST. Okay. So this was about the phenomenology of uh, strong lensing, just to again to catch your attention. Now I'm going to discuss a bit more uh, the two regimes of uh, the two main regimes of gravitational lensing that you might have heard of. This, all these were examples of strong gravitational lensing. There is another side of lensing which is less spectacular, but nonetheless very useful, which is called weak lensing. And so I'm going to discuss the differences between those, uh, those regimes. And then we're going to talk about how they, can, they are used in, uh, in cosmology. So if you have no further question, yeah. let's discuss the strong and the weak. So don't, you know, uh, spoiler alert, the weak has to stay away from the ring. <coughs> right, that's, that will be the main difference. So, strong and weak lensing. So, let me start from the very basics. The formalism of gravitational lensing that is known as the lens equation. So, here is how it works. Um, you have, suppose that you have a point source uh, that you would observe in the absence of uh, lensing in a certain direction, beta, with respect to an arbitrary um, you know, reference uh, that would be uh, incarnated by this line, the line of sight. Okay? And suppose that you have an object on the way, uh, like a, a massive uh, red galaxy, an elliptical galaxy. Um, so 
the first thing that we do is that uh, because in general, this is true for, uh, for all the practical systems that we study, the distance between the observer and the deflector and the, the distance between the deflector and the source is usually much larger than the typical scale of the deflector. You can usually consider that everything is happening on the plane. So in the sense that in the, in the sense that you can project the density of matter corresponding to the deflector on the plane that you call the deflector plane. And then you work in two dimensions in, in, this, uh, in this plane. So then suppose that you have a, uh, well, when you, cons when you consider the way light is emitted and what's the trajectory of light in the absence of any other perturbation, the light emitted by the source goes in straight line until it reaches the deflector plane, where it is suddenly deflected. Again, we consider everything is happening in one plane. It's suddenly deflected by a quantity that we call the deflection angle that they denote with an alpha hat that you can connect very easily to the distribution of matter. So this is the uh, surface density of matter that you have within this uh, deflector's plane. And so of course, it depends on the way you hit. X is here the, the uh, point of the plane where it, uh, light is hitting the plane. So it, it depends on, on where you hit it because it depends on the local gravitational field that you experience. So for uh, purely geometrical reasons, this um, this uh, deflection angle is not exactly the same as the difference between the direction theta in which you see the image and the um, direction beta in which you would see it without the lens. Actually, they are proportional. What we call the displacement angle, so really the difference between theta and beta, displacement on the sky that you would have on this uh, object, is proportional to the deflection angle with a ratio of those uh, angular diameter distances. So there are angular diameter distances. If, you, if you're wondering why there are angular diameter distances, not luminosity distances or moving distances or whatever, you can ask me at the end and we can discuss that. So this uh, then leads by definition, because again, this alpha, I define it as the difference between theta and beta. This leads to uh, one of the simplest equations uh, that you can think of, we call it the lens equation. So this is just the, therefore, the equation that relates the image position to the source position. And this is, therefore, the equation that you want to solve if for theta, if you want to know what are the possible images of a single, um, uh, single source that would be in the direction B. Um, what else can I say about this? Yes, um, because everything is happening in a single plane, and when you look a little bit into uh, look a little bit at the um, expression of this quantity, you can see that you could express it as a gradient, just like the gravitational acceleration can be expressed as the gradient of a gravitational potential. So in that sense, it would the alpha here would be the can be written as the gradient of a projected gravitational potential that we uh, call the Fermat potential. So everywhere when I have this alpha theta, I could replace it with the gradient of, uh, of a quantity psi, uh, the Fermat potential. We call it the Fermat potential because as you will see a bit later, it is connected to the time it takes for light to go from the, the source to the observer. And this will be essential when we discuss time delays. Okay, so far so good. It's uh, not very complicated math. So let me show you an example. So here I made a little uh, simulation for you. So what we see here is uh, what we would see on the sky, right? So uh, this is a certain source, a uh, light source. This is the deflector that I modeled as a singular isothermal ellipsoid. So it's really like a singular isothermal sphere, the thing that we use to describe globular clusters, for example, or elliptical galaxies. I gave it a certain ellipticity. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at different situations where the source, so you see the source is quite offset with respect to the deflector at that moment. They are far away on the sky. I'm going to move it so that it goes behind the deflector. And this is how it looks. See, it gets closer. A second image appears, a fourth, three, four image appear as well. Right and then they disappear. So again, uh, I'm going to show this, uh, this again. 
it's interesting to see that actually the what we call the ring is the merger of four images in this case. So in this little simulation, you can actually already visualize the two regimes that we call weak lensing and strong lensing. So clearly when you have a, a situation like this, which is a ring of four images, one image that is very, uh, very distorted, you are in the regime of, uh, of strong lensing. When you're at the end here, when the, uh, the source is quite far from the deflector, there is no way that you can really tell whether this experience lensing or not. And actually, I lied to you. I said this is the. I said that this is the um, the source. But actually, the source that I've taken was circular. So here, it's distorted into a little ellipse. But you have. But you were not shocked about it, right? When you saw it, I tell. I told you that was a source. You were not particularly shocked, but you were surprised about it. You would accept it very, uh, very easily. So this is uh, the definition of what, what weak lensing is. Weak lensing is just uh, when you have lensing, but you, can actually, you cannot really tell it by eye. And so uh, the formalism is a little bit different in this case. Is that clear or is, is just I'm spending too much time on, on simple things? So it's, no, it's okay, go ahead. Okay, it's okay, okay, okay. so I go ahead. So um, how does that work? So when you are in the situation where a source is quite far, quite offset with respect to the deflector. As I say, you have this kind of, of uh, situation. So you have weak distortions. And on top of it, well, if, suppose that you call theta zero the direction in which you see the center of, uh, of this image. Well, you can tell that uh, the various points that compose this image, uh, they are quite close with, they are quite close another next to each other, the distance, the typical distance that you have between two points that compose this image is typically small compared to the typical evolution scale of this quantity of the, def the deflecting potential. So in weak lensing, what is typically done is that you expand this quantity, you tailor expand it at first order in the difference delta theta between, so the center of the image, and any point that compose the image. So when you do that, uh, of course, you get this, uh, this uh, first order expansion of a gradient that is the second derivative of psi. You can call this beta naught, which is the uh, position, the source position corresponding to uh, this um, image position to the center. And this is the way it's usually written. So this quantity here, this matrix A is called the distortion matrix. It is defined by this quantity. So one minus the second derivative of the Fermat potential. And it's usually parameterized with two numbers. So first of all, realize that it, because this is a second derivative, the matrix corresponding to it, so it's a Hessian metric, matrix, it is symmetric. So you can, you can split it into a trace part, which is, in, which is represented by this kappa quantity that we call the convergence. And so the convergence, imagine that, suppose that you have only that quantity and that this other uh, quantity gamma is zero. If you have only kappa, this matrix is just proportional to the identity matrix. So when you apply it to a certain image or a certain source, you just multiply every, all, all the, the vectors by a certain number. So you just make it bigger or smaller. So this is what convergence is about. Convergence is creating a zooming in if it's positive mm -hmm. or zooming out if it's uh, negative. And physically speaking, it is due to the matter that is encountered by the light beam that goes from the source to, uh, to, the, to the observer. And then you would tell me, yes, but uh, this is weird. You're talking about uh, matter that, that is intercepted but uh, clearly, when I'm in a situation like that, there is no way that, uh, that light encounters any matter because clearly it's out of this. Don't forget that there is dark matter and dark matter halos are very extended. So typically when you see an image like this, uh, this uh, the light goes through some matter anyway and there is all the matter that you don't see. So you have convergence. The second effect that is encoded into the trace-free part of that distortion matrix is called the shear. 
And so as the name indicates, what it does is that it shears the, um, it shears the, um, the, the image. So if you are starting from a, um, a circular source, it will look elliptical just like that, exactly as we see in this example. So it is usually represented by a complex number. Uh, so you take this quantity and you uh, add i gamma two. Well, so nothing very complicated. But I'm giving these details because these quantities are uh, basically the, the key quantities that you will encounter if you read any paper about weak gravitational lensing. Weak gravitational lensing is just all about convergence and uh, above all shear. Physically speaking, this shear is due to the tidal forces that are produced by the deflector. Just like um, well, uh, the moon or the sun are creating tides on the earth that are distorting the shape of the oceans and of the earth as well. Well, a light beam experiences uh, tidal forces when it grazes a, a mass concentration that uh, is making it look like this. So because I, see, I can see that some of you are, are, are uh, getting a bit tired, I'm going to uh, propose you a little riddle. So the shear that you see here is creating, and you have seen that in all the images that I've shown you, it's creating an elongation that is tangential to the, uh, to the mass concentrations, right? So here the elongation is really in that direction. But the tidal forces are they're supposed to act in the opposite direction, right? In principle, when you're coming next to an object like this, it should be elongated in the uh, radial direction and contracted in the other direction. So how is that? So you think about that and we talk about it uh, afterwards. Well, the thing is that you call it tidal force, but it's not really a force. It's a tidal Fermat potential gradient. It is, uh, it is the vital part of a Riemann tensor, <laughs> which is tidal forces, right? It is, it is. It is really tidal forces. But the tidal force is affecting, in the case of the moon Earth system, is affecting the Earth. Yes. Where that's, there it looks like it's affecting the moon. I mean, it's not affecting the lens. It's affecting the image of the moon. It's affecting. Yeah, the but, no, but I'm talking about the, the, the. So if you represent, if you represent the beam as something, as an, the light beam as an extended physical um, object, when it, when it comes next to the deflector, it will experience tidal forces. It's the beam that it's the it's light that experiences uh, the tidal forces here. Again, that is the big addition of general relativity with respect to Newtonian physics. It's not just physical massive object or massive object that experience gravity and therefore spatial uh, and therefore sorry uh, space time curvature, but any type of entity that has energy, so light included. So the part of the beam that is closer to the to the lens. Is attracted. Is it attracted more? Light, yeah. is, yes, it's okay. it's that you can phrase it this way. Light is more deflected here than here, mm -hmm. so you have tidal forces. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So this was uh, weak lensing. Uh, what else do we have? Oh yes, I lied to you uh, because I said that weak lensing uh, is just about convergence and shear. So this is a little remark of uh, something we've done with Jean Philippe uh, in uh, a few years ago. In fact, weak lensing is supposed to be when the deflection is small. So it's supposed to be when this alpha quantity is small. But that doesn't mean in principle that you can make a Taylor expansion of it. Consider a situation like this where you have, you would have a lot of diffuse halos um, of, of matter, dark matter, whatever you want, and that you have a source that has a, a size that's comparable to the typical uh, scale of well, typical distance between those halos. All those deflectors are producing small deflections, but it would be really wrong to write, to expand the total effect of them as, uh, as this first order Taylor expansion, right? When you have a function that does this, you don't do a Taylor expansion to go from here to here. Okay, it's a bit of a theoretical curiosity, to be honest with you, because when you uh, do the actual calculations of how that works, and you look at whether this affects uh, current surveys or the analysis of weak lensing that we usually do, it is not relevant in any practical uh, situation. But it's something maybe to keep in mind. It's the, the picture of uh, weak lensing being a first order Taylor expansion, creating this kappa and this gamma is a bit of a, a simplification. 
Another thing we can say about weak lensing is that it is cumulative um, in, a very simple, in a very simple way. So weak lensing, as I said, is something that happens when you have, a, when the deflectors are far away, when the effect of lensing is small. But so when you have a situation like this, when you have a deflector that's causing a, a, in the, on the sky, you know, you have a galaxy, you consider that there is another galaxy far away that distorts the shape of the source galaxy. Well, of course, it will not be the only one. Right? The logic here is that if you have one weak lensing effect, you will have many of them. Everything that is in the universe around your line of sight is going to create a weak lensing effect on what you look at. So uh, typically, it's really wrong to consider that everything happens in a single plane when you have weak lensing. Weak lensing is really a cumulative effect of all the, quant all the uh, matter in homogeneities that will be uh, reasonably close to the line of sight. And the good thing is that because you can linearize everything, the way that you, do, that you distort a source like this it's extremely simple. You can consider that everything happens on a line of sight that is not changed. This is called the Born approximation. And you can just add up the effect of all those lens planes uh, to get the net convergence or the net shear. So in summarizing, when you see a distortion of a certain galaxy, it is due to the weak lensing effect of all what happens along the line of sight between the observer and the source. So yes, summary between the strong and the weak. So strong lensing produces multiple images, strong distortions like giant arcs, strong magnifications. It's due to typically due to one single isolated compact lump of matter. Uh, while weak lensing is producing only one image, you will not have a second image in the case of weak lensing. And it's due to many diffuse lump on the line of sight or from uh, compact lumps, but that are far away from the line of sight. And in terms of modeling, uh, you need a fully nonlinear modeling of, uh, of your uh, system when you do strong lensing, meaning that you need to model accurately this quantity if you want to explain a certain observation. And you will have to solve this equation, which is not always a trivial thing to do. While weak lensing, is from a theoretical perspective, is extremely simple, you obtain, uh, you go from image to source just by multiplying by a certain matrix, which is which contains this convergence and this shear. And so this is why I was saying that the weak has to stay away from the ring, right? So because it, uh, the Einstein ring that would be created uh, from a, a certain compact lump has to be far away if you want to be effective before. And that's for the job. Do we have questions about that? I think I'm still on time. Okay. So I presented those two regimes of gravitational lensing, the weak and the strong. Now let's see what we can do uh, with them in cosmology. So I'm still in this phase where I'm doing a bit of a review of the general context of uh, where these, uh, these things are happening. I will go to um, more um, recent work in after this section. So uh, let me give you the example that you have probably heard the most about, especially if you're a cosmologist which is called time delay cosmography. So we, strong gravitational lensing can be used to measure the expansion rate of the universe. <laughs> How does that work? Suppose that you have a system like this, which again represents um, a quasar, an AGN, that is multiply imaged. Here we have four images uh, called A, B, C, D. Quasars have the advantage of not being very stable objects. They have fluctuations, they have flares, they have eruptions, they have plenty of things that we don't really understand that are happening in, in quasars that are making them brighter or fainter with time. You can record, you can um, uh, monitor the luminosity of those various images. And what you get is a plot that looks like this, uh, this plot here. It's the monitoring has been happening over a lot of time. This starting in 2003 for this object and stopped in 2016. So we have uh, more than a decade of, uh, of observation here. And you can't really see it, but there is a, well, I mean, there is a slight shift between those four, uh, those four um, luminosity functions. They're a little bit offset with respect to each other. 
which again corresponds to the fact that light takes a different time depending on which path it takes to go to go from the observer uh, from the source to the observer typically when you go closer to the uh, to the lens it takes you more time it's as if light were slowing down when it uh, when it experiences strong gravitational fields so monitoring these uh, these light curves you can actually measure to a pretty good level of precision the time delay that you have between those uh, between those images why is that interesting because when you write down the theoretical expression of this time delay between two different images let's say between a and b it takes that uh, well the, the expression is the following so this is the time delay between a and b here you have a ratio of angular diameter distances, so between the observer and the deflector, between the observer and the source, and the deflector and the source. Alpha, you remember, is the displacement angle. So, right, so this would be alpha is the difference between the source position and the image position for A. This is the same for B. And remember, this psi is the Fermat potential. Okay. So when you have an observation like this, what you can C directly, of course, is this quantity. You measure the time delay from the, those uh, time series, and you have the position of, uh, of the images. And then you don't have only those four positions. I don't know if you can see it, but you also have the ring around it. And the ring contains a lot of information about, about the lens, because different lenses are producing different Einstein rings. So with this, Using all the rest of the photometric information here, you can model what, uh, what your lens is about. So you can model these quantities, alpha and psi, from the observation of the ring. So you know that, you know all the rest, that means that you have access to that quantity with photometric and time delay differences. So this thing we call time delay cosmography is actually a distance measurement. It gives you access to a ratio of angular diameter distances. And so here, the cosmologists know where I'm going when you have distances, and because you can also measure the redshifts of these quantities, uh, you have access to the expansion rate. Right? Distance redshift relation. This is the good old Hubble idea. If you write down a bit more accurately what it is, so the, diff the distance between these uh, A and well, between oh, well, A, B being O, D, S, you have something that depends that is inversely proportional to the Hubble expansion rate, H naught. And you have here a quantity that depends on the other cosmological parameters, like the quantity of matter, the cosmological constant, spa uh, spatial curvature, if you have it. These parameters, we have modeled them pretty, uh, well, we measure them pretty accurately with supernovae, uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, cosmic micro and background. So we have access to H naught. This is how it works. You have questions. How precise this measurement can be? Ah, so <laughs> yes, I will explain this. <laughs> I will explain. No, 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 I will explain this. So uh, this, this uh, there is a history about this, right? So in 2019, um, there was the Holy Cow collaboration that is doing that that published a paper saying a 1.4% measurement, I think it was like that, or 2% measurement of H0 using uh, six, uh, of six uh, systems like this. This is one of the systems that they used. Turns out that this precision is highly overestimated because they had not accounted for one effect, which is well, a theoretical point that was made a long time ago, the mass sheet degeneracy. So yes, I was thinking maybe I will skip that slide and come back, but you asked the question, so I will explain. So uh, here is the problem with the, the method that I have just described. It heavily relies on the imaging data. So it, it relies on observing the ring to determine what is the Fermat potential and what is the deflection angle that you have to plug it into the time delay formula. Problem is uh, there is no uh, unicity in the models that work uh, to explain a certain uh, certain image. And here is the very simple um, three lines of calculation to explain why. Suppose that you have a certain model alpha. So again, everything is contained in alpha or in psi, right? So this is a certain model that works 
let's say, you have found a model of lens that works to describe this object that you see. Suppose that now when you multiply this equation by a certain quantity lambda, a, a number between zero and one. So here I've done nothing, right? If theta and B, uh, theta is a solution of that, it's also a solution of that. Now I'm rearranging a little bit, right? Instead of having this theta, I'd, I wanted to put, to put this expression in the same form as this one. So I'm adding theta and I'm taking out theta. I'm regrouping the terms and I'm defining beta prime as lambda beta, an effective source. I don't care, I don't observe the source. Nobody knows where the source is. And another model alpha prime, which is just this combination between a theta, lambda, and alpha. So we have here two models that are different, right? Because the alpha is not the same. Two lens models that are the same and that provide an equally good fit of the data. Problem is they don't predict the same time delays, right? If you, so again, three lines of calculations, I'm not writing them, but if you plug the, uh, this model alpha in the formula that I gave you before, you can show that the prediction of the time delay between let's say images one and two is lambda times uh, the, the model you started from when you, when you work with the, the prime uh, quantity. So that means that you have two equivalent models that predict different values for that quantity. You observe this one, you model this one, but you have this uncertainty. So the only way to have those match is to change that quantity, to change the ratio of distance, and therefore you change H naught. So that's why uh, uh, you have that. The H naught that you measure with this model is lambda times the H0 that you would measure with this model. That's pretty bad, right? So that's called the mass sheet degeneracy because this model here is equivalent to taking from the initial model a part of the mass that was contained in this and spreading out as a homogeneous mass sheet because this term is actually the deflection that would be produced by a continuous uh, sheet of mass. It doesn't look very physical to do that, but on the other hand, you could imagine a very uh, shallow dark matter halo that would have a mostly homogeneous density of matter and that would produce a similar effect. So that's why it's called the mass sheet degeneracy. So that's a problem. The only way to mitigate it is to have, uh, is to have an extra measurement, a non-lensing measurement that would give you information about this alpha to make the difference between alpha and alpha prime. You need information about the mass distribution of your lens. And this is done by spectroscopy, by looking at the dispersion, velocity dispersion of the stars within the lens. And this is what can give you more information about it. The only thing is that it's a bit difficult and the data is not uh, very good at the moment. We expect it, we expect this method to still reach a 1% uh, precision in the coming five to 10 years. But we're not there yet. The current stages is this one. So these are the measurements uh, accounting properly for this mass sheet degeneracy uh, with different assumptions. And we're not going to the details. So these are different measurements of H0 by using these time delay cosmography method with seven time delay lenses. You can't read, so I'm reading it for you. Um, and so if you compare with the Hubble tension that we have today, so between the measurement of H0 using the cosmic microwave background, so the, the Planck measurement, or the one that you do directly with the distance ladder, so supernovae and cepheids to calibrate the luminosity of supernovae, you get uh, something that is basically in agreement with both. So for the moment, uh, for the moment, um, uh, the H naught tension cannot is not solved, is not addressed by uh, time delay cosmography. It will be in the near future. Yes. So what's the redshift of these two? Because uh, very strange is that one is co uh, uh, consistent with the. Uh, uh, supernovas and one with CMB. The yeah, it's, it's uh, different. So yeah, different. it's different. So it's different assumptions. So um, this is uh, uh, this this measurement and this one, well, the, mostly this one, is when you do not use any further information about the lenses. So you have your seven lenses, and they are at redshift uh, between. So the lenses typically around zero point five, and the source is typically one. So when you observe that and you use no information about velocity dispersion, so no further information, no non-lensing information, you get that with the big error bar. You can try to mitigate it a little bit by using uh, 
uh, velocity dispersion data. But the problem is that the lenses that were used by the TD Cosmo team, they didn't have measurements for those lenses of the velocity dispersion. So, so they took another set of lenses, the slack sample that I showed at the beginning, uh, the, these 84 lenses, they used measurements of velocity dispersion in those, um, in, in those data, and they assumed that the properties of the lenses were similar. That's a big leap, right? So, and this, so these, are, these are the two measurements. Those two measurements are assuming that the slack lenses for which we have a velocity dispersion measurement are representative of the TD Cosmo lenses that were used to uh, measure heat loss. Okay, um, there is another thing that uh, I wanted to mention about how to do cosmology with uh, strong lenses. It's just because it's cute and because well, it's a pity Rafael Gavazzi is not here anymore but because he's the one who observed this. So uh, when you have, uh, you have situations called the jackpot lenses, jackpot because it's really rare, you have an alignment between a deflector and two sources. And this makes two rings, concentric rings, this, this one and this one, as you can see. This is absolutely magnificent, uh, very lucky. And so when you do that, uh, you can look at the ratio between the angles, uh, between the, uh, the radii, and this, these depend uh, on the redshifts, but also on the cosmological parameters. And this has been used uh, to make forecasts for a cosmological. Yes. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I will do. I will go quickly. So blah, blah, okay, weak lenses. So weak lensing. So this is important because this is where I want to go. Uh, <laughs> so weak lensing is less spectacular. It is less uh, less beautiful images, but it is very useful in cosmology. So what, the way it's done is the following. Suppose that you observe a lot of uh, a lot of galaxies. Because the universe is not homogeneous, you have all the foreground matter that is causing distortions. Of those, uh, of those galaxies, so that actually you should see them a bit like this. Because of this shear effect, you would see the shape of those galaxies, the ellipticity of those galaxies, tangentially aligned with the overdensities of matter. So basically, the uh, apparent ellipticity, you can write it as the uh, intrinsic ellipticity plus this shear quantity. Problem is, uh, the effect of shear is weak lensing is weak, right? So the effect is extremely small. We're talking about a 1% effect. So you should see that, but you actually see that. So you can't do it by eye, right? You can't measure directly this shear from the shape of the apparent shapes of galaxies. You need to rely on statistics. And the way you do it is you take the apparent ellipticity of pairs of galaxies. Let's say you take pairs separated by the same amount or by the same order of magnitude for the angle. And you sum this quantity that's making the two point correlation function of the apparent ellipticity of galaxies. When you plug in this expression into uh, this, what you get is three terms, of course. This is the correlation of the apparent ellipticities, the correlation between apparent ellipticity, oh, sorry, of intrinsic ellipticities, between intrinsic ellipticities and shear, and the two point correlation function of shear. But this guy is random in principle. The orientation of galaxies is not something that is supposed to be correlated. So these two terms vanish. And you're left with uh, the two point correlation function directly of the shear, which is related to the distribution of matter in the universe. Again, the idea being that if you have a, a universe which is more homogeneous, you have this effect is stronger, and they have more correlations between two neighboring galaxies, their shapes will be more correlated. When you work out the math, you realize that this two point correlation function is proportional to two key parameters of cosmology, the density of matter, and this quantity called sigma eight, who knows what sigma eight is. So for those of you who don't know, Sigma eight is a quantity that uh, is an indication of the degree of inhomogeneity of the universe. If you're taking balls of eight megaparsecs of size, and within those balls, you average the uh, density of matter that you have, and you do that a lot uh, everywhere, and you look at the variance of this uh, averaged mass density, so it gives you something that fluctuates, the variance of this quantity or the uh, standard deviation of this quantity is what we call sigma eight. 
So you have more homogeneous in the universe, the, the larger sigma is. Um, the current status of that is the following. So these quantities have been measured with, with uh, different surveys, the dark energy survey, the kilodegree survey, so DS and KISS. Uh, recently, there was a joint uh, analysis of their data. And you can see that it is more or less in agreement, well, it is in, in reasonably good agreement with uh, observations that were made by, uh, with this um, cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background is in blue and the lensing measurements are the other colors. I showed here two planes, right? There is the, the plane omega m sigma eight. There is also this quantity, the uh, S eight, which is sigma eight times something proportional to a square root of omega m, the quantity that I gave you before. So this is supposed to be the quantity that is best constrained by lensing. And you see indeed that this reduces the uh, degeneracy that you have. So this seems to be fantastic, but this is actually a very difficult measurement. Weak lensing is very difficult. If I'm writing down again the assumption that I made here, which is that when you look at the apparent, uh, the, uh, look at the uh, two-point correlation function of the apparent ellipticity of galaxies, I wrote those three terms and I assumed that these were zero. Well, first of all, this one is super hard to do. Measuring the apparent ellipticity of galaxies is not a trivial thing at all. You have plenty of observational biases that can, uh, that can enter into the game. There are, plenty, there are PH, entire PhD theses that were dedicated to that. And then I assume that those things were vanishing. Well, they're vanished because they are supposed to be a sum of a lot of random numbers. Well, so you need a lot of galaxies to do that. Right? So you need a lot of data if you want to be able to neglect those things with respect to that. Remember that gamma is a very small quantity. So you need this, this thing to go to zero uh, very fast. Well, it doesn't go to zero very fast, so you need a lot of data. Something else is that galaxies can be intrinsically aligned because of other gravitational effects. There are people in this institute that worked on that very hard. They're not in the room. Oh, maybe Clotilde. Clotilde worked a bit on this, <laughs> yes, but she was not paying attention. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, so this was just to say that uh, you have weak lensing is a difficult thing, and you have plenty of biases, of systematic biases that can enter into the game. So this leads me to is there another way? Can we do weak lensing in another way? And so the problem again is that. Weak lensing is weak. So if I apply shear to this, you don't you have no way to, to know whether this was, uh, the, what is the source, what is the image. You have no way to, to measure the, uh, uh, the shear directly from a single galaxy. It would be possible if we had some kind of standard shape, something that we, could, we would know the intrinsic shape of, that you, could, that you could calibrate, so that you would see directly if there is a shear effect. And so the idea is that, well, maybe Einstein rings could play that role. Maybe we could use Einstein rings as standard shapes. Do you have questions before I go to this? No, sure, so it works. Huh? Huh? I have five minutes. Well, five, I think uh, five minutes will do. I don't have questions, keep going. <laughs> I have questions. Okay. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> so this is uh, when the strong lensing helps the weak lensing. So, you know, in the, I can't carry for you, for you, but I can carry you. Right. So um, I'm coming back to uh, this. How, so my idea is to use um, strong, strong lenses as weak lensing probes. So I need to study the weak lensing of strong lensing. You know, how does weak lensing perturb string lensing? I have to put the, these, these two things together. So I reminded you here uh, the lens equation that we have when we have a single plane, right? Now, suppose that I add perturbations to this. So weak lenses <coughs> on the way. We call that line of sight perturbations. I have a different picture, right? Light is not being propagated in straight line from the observer to the deflector, from the deflector to the source. And so when you work out the uh, modified lens equation that you have in this case, it becomes like this, a bit more complicated. You have in this new lens equation, the addition of three new, three additional distortion matrices, this AOS, ADS, AOD. You remember the distortion matrix is what qualifies weak lensing. So this is really how weak lensing is affecting strong lensing measurements. 
For you to understand why there are three of them and what they represent, just to give you a flavor of it, for example, this one, you see AOD. So this represents the uh, distortions that are happening between the observer and the deflector. And you see that they appear here in the argument of the quantity that represents the strong, uh, the, um, sorry, the, uh, the deflection. So this point actually, so this, this uh, perturbation, sorry, encodes the deviation from the Born approximation. What happens is that because light is deflected, weakly deflected be between the observer and the deflector, it reaches a point in the main lens plane that is not the same as the one that it would have reached in the absence of those perturbations. So you need to account for this to evaluate the deflection in the main lens plane at the right point. Whence the presence of this guy in this, uh, in this argument. And you can play this as we can make a similar reasoning about uh, the other one. So this one accounts for the fact that the initial opening here does not reach the same difference here than in the absence of, um, of perturbations. And I will not discuss this one, but you got the idea, right? You have three uh, new distortion matrices that encode in different ways the weak lensing perturbations to strong lensing. So that looks very complicated because uh, we have a lot of additional parameters in our modeling in principle. <laughs> Turns out that they are not all necessary. So I will go very quickly to uh, this. Take this, I'm playing the same ga game as I did for the, um, uh, for the mass sheet degeneracy. I use the fact that I don't know where the source is. I can transform it the way I want. So I multiply this equation by a certain matrix, this one, that allows me to put the lens equation into a very elegant form where I have only one distortion matrix here that I call ALOS, which is this multiplication of the three that I had at the beginning. And why did I do that? Because actually when I'm doing this, I'm making this quantity as a, perf uh, as a total derivative. So I cast this term into an effective potential that contains the foreground perturbations. And so this model is absolutely equivalent to the previous one, but it has less degrees of freedom because you have only one thing, an effective quantity uh, describing the main lens, and you have a single perturbation, weak lensing perturbation here. So I call it because it has less parameters, the minimal model for line of sight perturbations. And in particular, it features a kind of effective shear, the shear that would be contained in this quantity, if you linearize that, is just this the sum of the shears with certain signs, right? You have OS plus OD minus DS. Okay. Where is he going with this? Well, I'm, I'm telling you here that I managed to uh, cast all the perturbations of a strong lens into a single shear parameter. Remember that one, what I want to do is to do cosmic shear with strong lenses. So the question is, can we actually measure this guy from strong lenses? So we did that. Uh, we made a proof of concept of the measurement that I said the project has been led by Natalie Hawk, who's a postdoc working with me uh, at uh, IPHG, but also now at, uh, in Montpellier. We used a software called Lenstronomy that's been developed by Simon Biller a few year, years ago. So we simulated mock images uh, of strong lensing that were perturbed. And then we tried to fit them to see whether we can simply uh, recover that quantity, uh, that line of sight shear that we're looking for. So I'm um, passing the details of how we do the thing. This is the sample that we generated. So with lenstronomy, you can see that some lenses are very beautiful. Some of them are a bit more pixelated. <laughs> Uh, some of them looks more like Einstein crosses. So this is to tell you that the sample that we generated is pretty representative of the diversity of actual observations. And this is the final result. So what you see here is the comparison between the input line of sight shear that we have put for in these uh, in these mock data. The y-axis is the one that is obtained, the output of the, uh, of the MCMCs, basically, of the fitting procedure. Um, you have the first component and the second component. That's why we have uh, two panels. 
And the error bars, of course, represent the uncertainty that we have in the recovery of those parameters. And so you see that the correlation between the input and the output is pretty good. There is a dispersion, right? Of course, we have an average uncertainty on those uh, on those uh, line of sight uh, line of sight shears that is about zero, well, about one percent, which is the order of magnitude of what we are trying to measure. But this is a good indication that it seems that yes, this line of sight shear can be uh, extracted from observations independently of the pro properties of the lens. So and this leads me to my last slide. Why, uh, why are we doing that? So it's to try to do for cosmic shear with Einstein rings. The idea would be that in a survey like Euclid, we'll have galaxies, galaxy shapes, but also strong lenses. And so we can do the two point correlation function of this line of sight shear. We can correlate it with the apparent ellipticity of galaxies and with the apparent positions of galaxies. We are adding a lot of data that doesn't suffer from the same systematics as uh, a standard weak lensing. So this is the project, actually the Elrond project. This is very serious, right? It's for Einstein lensing rings to observe the non-baryonic matter distribution. It's been funded by the ANR, so, so I think it's, uh, it's a serious project. Uh, so the idea is that to forecast the cosmological advantage of this line of sight shear, assuming that we can measure it, so this is what we are doing at the moment, confirm the me measurability of the LS shear on real data, so we are going to use uh, JWST data to start with, and explore some line of sight perturbations beyond shear, such as flexion, you can ask me about it if you want. We are hiring next autumn. If you're looking for a postdoc and you like lensing, uh, talk to me. And so this, I leave you with my conclusion. I thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over time. So do we have questions for Pierre? Question, Pierre, very interesting. Can you just explain qualitatively? I mean, you've got shapes for a billion galaxies in Euclid. And tell me how you're going to do better with 10,000 lens, strong lenses. 100,000. <laughs> But the whole point is that you, you wouldn't have, so it's the question of statistics versus accuracy, right? Signal to noise versus statistics. The whole point of uh, cosmic shear is that you have a lot of data and you use the fact that those numbers to kill a terrible signal to noise. Terrible, you have a signal to noise, which is 0 .0, 0 0.01, basically. Here we would have a signal to a noise that is hopefully larger than one. The other thing is that you, so the hope is also that well the hope this measurement wouldn't be affected by intrinsic alignments. Okay. So you mitigate intrinsic alignments with it. Okay. We have more questions. Uh, at some okay. point, you said you would explain why the tidal effect uh, operates counterintuitively. I said it was a riddle. Uh, I, I think I think you should think about it. <laughs> you talk about it. But I didn't find it. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it's it's all because no. But the whole point is that we uh, it's because it goes it's because of um, we think from source to observer rather than thinking from observer to source, right? So the idea is that uh, when you want a certain beam to match this, uh, a certain uh, morphology for a, for a source, and that it is distorted in a certain effect. Let's say you have an effect that is creating that, or you have gravitational effect that's causing that on your, uh, on your beam, so the beam does this. Well, you have to compensate for it at the level of the observer for it to match what you should reach at the level of the source. You see what I mean? So instead of, you have, instead of having straight lines, I, I should draw, but you know, um, instead of having straight lines, you have something that should be bigger if it's converged, or it should be smaller if, it's, if it diverges. I should make a drawing. That's the whole point. It's just go to the other way around. You want to make sure it reaches the observer. Yeah, yes, exactly. So suppose that you have something here that is causing a convergence. So it's creating, it's an attractive effect, right? The light beams, they are doing this. Well, you see that you see it bigger because you had to start with a larger angle for it to, because of the deflection, for it to match here. And so this 
You, know, you don't see what I mean. Don't. <laughs> 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 what should we do? Okay, yes. Yeah. Compared to if it had propagated in a straight line. So whenever you have a gravitational effect that goes in a certain direction, the observation goes in the other. So it's the case for convergence. It's the case for shear as well. That was the I have a time delay to understand it, but I agree. <laughs> 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 yeah, Other questions? Yes. In um, the everyday optics, there is this Fermat principle that light chooses the path with the yeah. shortest time. Yeah. How does it relate to the geodesic principle in this gravitational context? That's a super good question. When, you, when you're studying <laughs> GR, usually, so you usually uh, see the definition of geodesics. As, uh, as the shorter shortest path, right? So this works very well when you have time-like geodesics or space-like geodesics, so time-like geodesics, right, lower lines. So you go from the actual trajectory is the one that has the shortest uh, um, proper time to go from a certain point to another. So it works pretty well with, uh, with that. It works very well with uh, space-like geodesics. Time-like, with a uh, light-like geodesics, the problem is that all the distances are zero, right? But there is a way around, uh, and uh, there is a Fermat uh, theorem in, uh, in GR that tells you that when you have, a... <coughs> so suppose that you have a certain, uh, an observer that has a certain world line, so this would be an observer. Uh, you have an, a point that's emitting light, so a source point, so a photon is emitted now. And so you're wondering uh, what is going to be the actual trajectory of light. That would be the actual trajectory. It's observed at a certain point. So this is the source. Well, if you're looking at all the possible null curves, so all the curves of, of something that's propagating at the speed of light, uh, but and that are reaching this, uh, this word line, <coughs> This one is the one that extremizes the time of arrival. Right. So that's a way to formulate the Fermat principle in general relativity. And so the, and it, it gives you have an equivalence between the geodesic <coughs> equation. So I, I made it maximal. It can be maximal or minimal. I never remember what, what, which one is the, uh, probably actually it should be in the other way around. Probably the observer should be here. But, uh, but you got the idea. There is a, this is the way to phrase the Fermat, uh, the equivalence between the Fermat principle and, uh, and the geodesic equation when you have known curves. <laughs> Okay, well, it's a bit late, but fine. Um, so um, I was thinking of a recent work about field level inference, Natalia Porcares at Imperial in particular, who showed that with weak lensing, if you analyze the full field, you can break the degeneracy between sigma eight and omega m that you have in the two point function. So uh, here you're proposing a new way to get a point measurement of shear, which is very interesting. So my question was just basically, why would you then limit yourself to the two point function to go back to cosmology? Uh, why would I? Because I'm because I'm bad with statistics, and so I'm doing what people what's known, you know. But yeah, I mean, of course, if you have uh, if anyone is proposing that, oh, yeah, let's do uh, let's use some higher order statistics on that, I would be super happy. I just uh, it's my lack of knowledge of uh, of these things that uh, at the moment makes it uh, yes. I'm starting with the easy stuff, but but yeah, you're right. Yari. <laughs> One naive question, um, for the time delay, um, could you, there's more information than just the, uh, the positions, there's also the, the relative magnitudes due to different amplifications, can that be used? It's, so it's not used much in practice, you're right, uh, it's, it's a very good remark because you think it would, shit, okay, um, no, well, I can explain that without slides anyway, so the, the issue is that the magnitude of a point, the, um, of a point image is, is, is a lot subject to microlensing. So when you have, you have these different paths of... Um, yeah, I understand. And so yes, you would have in the halo, sometimes a star, sometimes a cluster, sometimes maybe primordial black holes, who knows, you know? And, uh, and these are actually changing the, the magnitude, the apparent, uh, the amplification, and this is causing a lot of trouble to so uh, strong lensing. It's much more the amplitude than the position. Yeah, so actually it, well, yes, 
Oh, yes, the microlensing changes the amplitude. Yes, my question. Okay. Yes. More questions? Just maybe one to finish because you, you in your first slide, you allude to the fact that you have higher moments beyond, beyond the shear, so flexion wow. and sound. In your simulation, can you measure them and can you learn something from, from them? So we have a PhD student working on that uh, in, uh, in Montpellier. Uh, his name is Théo Dubosc. He's working with Julien Larena. And so this was uh, the first part of his PhD that was to try to phrase those things for flexion. So can you measure flexion with uh, Einstein rings? And uh, so yes, Théo is working on it. He derived already the equivalent of the line of sight here for flexion. And he's doing at the moment simulations to see whether it can be measured. It's harder. Okay. It's harder at the moment. We have not succeeded yet. I mean, here, but uh, we have hope. Thank you. So, if we don't have more questions, okay, then we can thank Pierre again. Thank you.